Wonderful. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Allison Heaney, VP of Learning and Public Programs at the Museum of Latin American Art. We welcome you today, Wednesday, November 29th, 2023, to this very special edition of MOLA Zoom Project focused on the Pacific Standard Time Art and Science Exhibition, Arteanica, Art, Science and Technology in Latin American Today. This MOLA project is part of the 2024 Getty Pacific Standard Time Art and Science Collide, a civic dialogue around some of the most urgent problems of our time by exploring past and present connections between art and science in a series of exhibitions, public programs, and other resources. <laughs> MOLA also acknowledges the support of the Dwight Stewart Youth Fund, the Miller Foundation, the Arts Council for Long Beach, and a special thank you to the California Arts Council Arts Exposure Grant for their constant support of the educational programs at the Museum of Latin American Art. In this chapter of MOLA's Zoom project, MOLA's chief curator, Gabriela Urtiaga, is joined by a panel of four very special guests brought together today to engage in a very important conversation about Arteanica, the original title of the exhibition by Brazilian art pioneer, Valdemar Cordero, and a catalyst for the Latin American art movement pioneered by the artists of the 60s and 70s, working at the intersection of art, science, and technology. In anticipation of MOLA's upcoming participation in the Getty's 2024 PST, uh, this episode marks the first in a series of episodes that MOLA will be leading up until the exhibition's launch in September, 2024. Along with our chief curator and project director of Arteanica, Gabriela Urtiaga, I am pleased to introduce a special guest, Ana Livia Cordero from Brazil, international well-known artist, dancer, choreographer, video maker, and computer dance pioneer, daughter of the leader of Brazilian concretist movement, Valdemar Cordero. We also have joining us Dr. Jose Carlos Maria Pigui, writer, curator, entrepreneur, and cultural of technology from Peru, founder of Alta Tecnologica in Lima, Senior Visiting Research Fellow in the Department of Media and Communications at the London School of Economics and a lecturer at LUISS Little Carali, Rome. We also have joining us Rodrigo Alonso from Argentina, professor and art curator, master's degree in fine arts, University of Buenos Aires, Argentina, specializing in contemporary art and new media, professor at the University of Buenos Aires and the Universidad de Salvador and the National University of Arts in Argentina. We also have joining us Tanya Aedo, cultural producer and experience in the development of projects working at the intersections of art, science, and technology. Uh, she's also the chair of transdisciplinary art and technology at UNAM. Uh, I wanna welcome everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to our live audience. Uh, we also have joining us uh, TLC Translation Services, Rocia and uh, Gabriela here. Uh, if you're interested in hearing this presentation in Spanish or English, there are the language options down below. Um, for the most part, this will be done in English. However, you can select the Spanish option there. Um, before I hand it over to our chief curator, I'd like to encourage our live audience to make use of the chat and Q&A features throughout this presentation. We'll do our best to integrate audience feedback. Uh, so with that, I would like to hand it over to Gabriela Ortiaga for this incredible project. Thank you. Thank you, Alison, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Welcome to MOLA. Bienvenidos a MOLA. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you to this remarkable panel we have today as we present Arteonica, the MOLA Art Project for the 2024 Gary Pacific Standard Time Program. As a MOLA Chief Curator and Project Director, it's a huge honor to present these remarks and talk briefly about Arteonica, art, science, and technology in Latin America today, a research project and the upcoming exhibition in September 2024. First, I would like to say that Arteonica take its name from the Brazilian electronic art pioneer, Waldemar Cordeiro, who was one of the South American first computer artists. His Arteonica, a verbal synthesis to electronic art and the original title of the exhibition he did in Brazil in 1971, frames the computer as an instrument for positive social change, which can democratize art and culture. So that is the beginning, the starting point for a comprehensive survey that takes us 
through a decade of conceptual, historical, and geopolitical change. The art project we are presenting today explore uh, this little known Latin American art movement, creating a dialogue between a group of pioneers from the 60s and 70s and the contemporary artists whose work respond to their legacy. Arteonica explore the history and present of electronic art from Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Peru, and Mexico, hand in hand with 20 marvelous artists. Despite challenging political and social conflict across Latin America in the 60s and 70s, the relationship between art, science, and technology expand during that period. Latin American artists and thinkers never stop working at the intersection of art, science, and technology, enriching the historic legacy with pressing contemporary discussion on participation, social engagement, indigenous knowledge, autonomies and living system, memory and network for global solidarity, which give rise the uncommon ground that provoke critical and the archaeological perspectives. Just to put a broader context to this, unlike the technological art creating in Latin America in the 60s and 70s, the art produced today comes from artists trained in universities and attentive to cultural history. The pioneering work of those decades was neglected for many years, but young researchers and scholars are making that seminal work visible. The recovery of the words and thought forget that the founding artists make consistent efforts to establish link between their own work and that of the Latin American pioneers who preceded them. Taking as a starting point the hypothesis that artists maintain ties to their specific social and cultural context, even in most of the creators from Latin America who lives in other latitudes as they have a special link to their places where they come from, we propose to develop an environment and a conceptual framework that allow us to address the singularities of the technological art coming from Latin America. Regarding this big picture we describe, the Arteonica work in progress is based in three curatorial access, and I would like to share with you briefly some names. The first on dedicated to the hybrid artifact, environmental investigation, and living system with the pioneer artist Teresa Burga from Peru, Juan Dabney from Chile, Marta Boto and Julia Kosice from Argentina, and also among the contemporary artists with Patricia Dominguez from Chile, Marcela de Armas from Mexico, Lucia Monge from Peru, and Victoria Grip from Brazil. Other axis is dedicated to the data colonization, artificial intelligence, and indigenous knowledge where you will find artists such as Waldemar Cordeiro and Ana Livia Cordeiro from Brazil, Francesco Mariotti from Mexico, Mariano Sardón from Argentina, Rejana, Rejane Cantoni from Brazil, Constanza Piña from Chile, and Juan Salas from Peru. And finally, there is a chapter dedicated to activism, networks and collaboration with Marta Minujín from Argentina, Paula Weiss from Mexico, Leo Núñez from Argentina, Tania Candiani from Mexico, 
Andorra Bartilotti from Mexico. So this is where we are so far. This is just the beginning. We are so thrilled to have such an incredible team working on this together. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody, again. And so now, let me introduce to Ana Livia, who is going to share with us her thoughts and knowledge and ideas. Thank you so much. Uh, hello. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Gabriela. Uh, are you listening to me? Yes. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for Mola. And um, I decided today to share with you the thoughts and the thinkings of my father that he did directly with me when I was very young, because he died when I was 19 years old, but I was with him always from five years old to 19. And he taught me many things that I never told anybody. So now it's time to share with you. It's an artist talk, it's not academic talk. So, um, uh, okay. Well, well, I cannot put full, full, okay. Well, to begin, to begin, uh, I wanted to explain the, the word arteonica, that means a uh, composition of two words, arte plus electronica, electronics, so arteonics. And this begin much before the his experiments with computer. And I'm going to read his own words, um, just a moment. He says, in digital art, digital is number, Method is numerically processed and reaches a higher degree of precision. Historical examples of digital art are Soha, analytical cubism, suprematism, neoplasticism, all constructivism, and concrete art. In digital art, a physical magnitude is represented by a number in probabilistic statistical terms that do not exclude resorting to chess. So that's the beginning of his research. That takes me back to the 50s when he began the concrete movement. And he, uh, in 52, they launched the manifest called Rupture. And he began saying, old art was great when it was intelligent. However, our intelligence cannot be the same as Leonardo's. He, he meant Leonardo da Vinci. History has taken a qualitative leap. There is no more continuity. Those who create new forms out of all the principle, principles, now we can distinguish those who create new forms out of new principles. In this moment, he begins to talk about science. And this, those new principles for him were, was the visual gestalt. This was his book that was always with him. It was a Spanish book, I mean, Argentinian book, actually. And uh, it's uh, 400 pages, and he was studying this. And this is the basis of all his concrete art creations. Nowadays, this field calls visual intelligence. So this is a very good book of how, uh, how the get visual gestalt progressed in time and arrived to this field of discussion and research that calls visual intelligence, how we create what we see. An example, for example, he always said to me, is the a principle of proximity, means the when elements are near each other. Here we have, a different, two different chromatic elements, the red ones and the blue ones. The red ones, they make a diagonal because they are all red. So our eye creates in our brain a diagonal. And this we can see in 
his works, the, simil the, the similarity between the elements. I'm, going to, I'm not going to analyze all the works because we have not time. So sorry, we are going, we are going to skip quickly. And then you have just a glance and then you can study this later. Another principle he, he always used is the principle of proximity. So when the same elements are near each other, they create groups. So you can see in the first, in the first image here with the white background, there are two losangles. And in the second one with the gray, you can see that the empty space without the, the sign of plus creates also images. That's very, very important. How the eye creates the reverse, the, the images you assign and the others that are created with the empty space. And here you have an example. The center of the work is empty, but you can see that's in the center. In this center, there is a rectangle twisted because your eye composes the groups of lines, always four lines. And well, we can talk a lot of this work, but sorry, I'm going to be very quick, but so I you to see this principle of uh, proximity. And here you have different elements, but grouped in, in proximities, making six groups of uh, square rectangles. And here you are going to see a video that shows how he worked because he never measured. He worked with the instruments of geometry, but never measured in centimeters or inches. So we are going to see how he did one work. So we prepare the space geometrically. It's just the construction of the square. The horizontal line and the center are the visual basis of this work. The symmetry of the square and the central line of the images are very important in this work. The center of the square is the center of the principal, the main circle. And there is no a complete circle, but our mind completes the image. The base of concrete art is the visual perception. Okay, now we stop. When we look to this image, we can see that the depth of the image is obtained not with the linear perspective that was that we 
uh, hunted from the Renaissance period and went through the whole figurativism, even contemporary art. So the depth was obtained through the superposition of the circles that you make up in your mind in using the vi visual gestalt. That's why he said there is no continuity in this manifest. It's a rupture. So now we have this and we can understand what he was saying, that was not Leonardo's intelligence because what was not the linear perspective from the Renaissance. Okay, going further. Uh, oh, sorry. Four years later, after um, 64, he began another period of his art called Pop Creto by the his partner, the poet Augusto de Campos, the concrete poet Augusto de Campos, and he called the same movement semantic concrete art. And he said, construct me semantically change of meaning based on space, light, and movement. In my words, the object ready-made is built and builds a space that's no longer the physical space. The disintegration of the space of the physical object is also a semantic disintegration destruction of conventionalities, and on the other hand, a semantic construction, the construction of a new meaning. So he goes from the pure syntax of the concrete art to the semantic concrete art, where he puts uh, the meaning, the social meaning. And here you have a work where he superposes two newspapers sheets. And if you and he's researching the intelligibility of the image, which means how much can you understand of the original image superposing two images? If you look at the, the, last, the last word, the big one, you can see the word revo, revolução, revolution in Portuguese. And you can, um, okay, it's in Portuguese, but I that speak Portuguese, I can recognize words. And this research of intelligibility went forward. And this is a work from Museum of Fine Arts of Houston, belongs to the, this museum. And it's an interactive work where the rules, the, there's the people that can displace the rules, destroy the original letters, and at the same time composing a new meaning, as he said. And this research of uh, intelligibility, he went further and then he, he was like cutting an image in square and, and researching how much he can put them, the squares uh, away of each other. And it's, at the same time, uh, you can still see the original image. And he went even to a statistic that you can see the second image, the black and white. And this was a very serious base for his computer artworks. When he entered in the computer artworks in 68, he, he began 67, but the first result was 68. He, he began using photos and he, he used to place a, a translucent paper with squares over the photo and he used manually to mark for each square a number that would correspond to the degree of uh, black and white, of gray. So here I took a detail in the second image, and then he would put uh, all those numbers in punched cards. And I want you to understand that the computer he used had five megabytes of storage and around 300 kbytes of memory. Look how primitive it was. And it, all this, this uh, computer was big as one room. So the very, very beginning. And then he would, uh, going back to the digitalization that was a manual scanning, let's say, he took each, each line of the, the sheet of paper he was putting the numbers uh, according to the degree of gray, he put in punch cards, 
each postcard was online and then he printed as in the second image, the numbers. Each number correspond to a degree of gray. Then the, a program will translate these numbers in degrees of gray, superposing letters. So if you look well, the number seven is white. And the name number one, it's the blackest he could obtain. And then he began to uh, research over those digitalized images. This work calls the woman that's not BB. BB is Brigitte Bardot. That was the French actress that was a sex symbols, a symbol at that moment. And she was like the most beautiful woman in the world, the perfect one. And then he took this woman that's not BB. That is a, a woman from the Vietnamese war in 71. His works from 71. And this is a very political work because he was uh, uh, choosing by random 27% of the numbers and the number that was chosen, they put the letter X. So he was kind of destroying the image. But he told me that if he had put 28%, you could not recognize the, the face anymore. So it's really very iconic because it deals with the destruction of the image, the intelligibility of the image, parallel to the meaning semantic of the word destruction. And also a fight against the mediatic uh, figures like uh, the actresses that we have to now. This is another work he did with the physics, Giorgio Moscati from 68. The first one he did. And the image, the original image is the first one. It's a val Valentine's Day poster. And you can see the two profiles of the enamorated people. And then the, you can see their bodies on the right side up. And the second image, he obtained it, the contour, the, the, the edges of the image. And the third one, the edge was more clear. This was a very science, much scientific research. And later, Giorgio Muscat sent me two articles, one from 1994, that they were researching artificial ret retina, retinas, I don't know how to say in English. Um, uh, how, how Researching how our eyes see the image. And the second article is the silicon retina from the Scientific American 1991. And they discovered that our eye look at the uh, reality, searching for the edges. We see one face because it is dis detach detached from the background. Uh, and then you can uh, like define the edges of an object. So what he was doing was very, very much related to science. In 72, he did the People series that is somehow related to our dictatorship because he began the first image with seven degrees of grace, and he rearrived of last image, this the, the fifth one, with just black and white, with just yes or no, of zero one, of binary information. And you know, dictatorship is a kind of political uh, situation that yes or no, you, you cannot have discussions, you cannot have um, many opinions. So this was this research, and the name, number, the name people, it was not by chance. The other one, the, his last research is very, very interesting, but he died unhappily, sleeping, and he could not go on. The second image is uh, an image of a house uh, in the north of Brazil, uh, and it's a superimposition of colors. Uh, I'm sorry, the colors are fading. This is 50 years ago, and you cannot see any more the original colors. So it's really faded, too much gray, but originally was blue, red, and yellow. The yellow was kind of green in the computer. And he superposed like the, the impressionistic, like Soha, 
he, he superposed the, 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 the colors, uh, obtained this effect of um, optical mixture. I don't know how to say in English again. And he said a second tendency in electronic art aims at create interdisciplinary works by taking advantage of scientific research and discoveries in neurology and psychology, gestalt, processing images with the aid of a computer. Typically synthetical, this tendency falls within a range of concrete art developed in the historical conditions of the first industrial revolution. Uh, suprematism, neoplastic, constructivism, and so on, which we created a machine learning for the urban and industrial society to communicate. In this sense, we can highlight the evident similar similarities between concrete art and computer art. And he goes on, the obsolescence of the traditional communication system of art Resides, resides in the limited consumptions implicit in the nature of the transmission medium. Due to the limited number of possible viewers, the high costs, the geographic limitations, and the technical difficulties, the traditional communication system of art fails to live up to the qualitative and quantitative cultural demands of modern society. He wrote this in 72, much before internet. So he would foresee what we are living now. Now, now we are living now if, if our Zoom, for example. That's it. Thank you. Uh -oh. Thank you, Anna Livia. Thank you for, for sharing your knowledge, your vision. It's a real honor. And let me say when I was naming the artist. I said, Rolly, that the artist Francisco Mariotti was from Mexico. <laughs> Sorry, Francisco, but actually he's from Peru. <laughs> that is correct. Uh, and now, Jose Carlos, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you. Do you see my screen? Yes. 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 Okay, well, um, first of all, uh, thanks Aurel and the team at MOLA for the invitation to participate in this uh, Zoom project, which is part of the Artronica exhibition. And I'm glad to share the, the panel with, with such a good friends like Tania and Rodrigo, and particularly Ana Livia, whom I admire and, and, and follow. I'm going to talk briefly about a, a topic that I haven't been researching for some time, which is cybernetics in Latin America, in which cultural and artistic practices I believe cannot be disentangled from other scientific research and computational practices, which through uh, local and international collaborations really influence the, the overall subject. Uh, I, will, um, I will connect this uh, small history with two artists that are part of the Artronic exhibition and that are considered pioneers, uh, Frances Frances Francesco Mariotti and, and Teresa Burga. But, um, when I call pioneer, I'm not only considering that they, they that they did works that were ahead of their time. I'm also um, uh, trying to depict that their work still carries a significance and and ever and has even inspired the work of new generations. So uh, these pioneering artists working in the 60s and 70s didn't work in isolation. They work as part of a society society was that was changing abruptly uh, usually in the context of technology uh, but but we mentioned usually the social and political context we don't mention the, the computational and cybernetic context which is what I, I will try to give first as a, as a background and then go to the works of, of these two artists so uh, I'll, I'll start by um, the arrival of the one of the first computers in Latin America uh, the one that arrived in Venezuela, uh, an IBM 650 in 1957, which also puts Strapet, and this is very interesting, the Department of Numerical Calculus at the University of Venezuela in Caracas, and particularly its Center for Development Studies, CENDES, which developed some of the most innovative numerical experimentation methods applied to Latin American social and economic reality at that time. Then, um, uh, I mean, 
A prominent figure is Manuel Sadowski, the founder of the Institute of Calculus of the Faculty of Exact and National and Natural Sciences in the University of Buenos Aires. He was a, the pioneer of computation, not just in Argentina, but also in Uruguay. Uh, and he was, a, he was a responsible for acquiring the first computer in Argentina, uh, a Ferranti Mercury, which was nicknamed uh, Clementina. Um, but the idea of having this computer was to, uh, once more, to use computation to solve the country's major problems. Uh, again, um, perhaps another uh, interesting uh, case was the Latin American well model at the Bariloche Foundation in Argentina, uh, in the Patagonia uh, region, which came with a response to the MIT's uh, limits of growth report that was quite uh, important at that time and that brought the use of computers and mathematical models for development of, of more disruptive and, and emancipatory perspective in which poverty was linked to inequality to injustice but also it it was uh, um, uh, it was shown that it was impossible to develop a pattern of universal consumption, which was the basis of Western definitions, uh, and and this also projected a, a a new society, a society in terms of utopia, and actually confronted some of the topics on science and technology with a, a, a new perspective, a more interdisciplinary perspective. Uh, then we have, of course, Project CyberScene very well known. Uh, recently, there was a podcast on, on it uh, produced by Evgeny Morozov uh, called the Santiago Voice. Uh, it was a project from 71 to 73 during the presidency of Salvador Allende uh, with the support of, of, of uh, a very well known English uh, managerial sovereignty, Stafford Beer. And once more, it also aimed at constructing a distributed decision support system to aid uh, the management of the Chilean economy, mostly the, the nationalized uh, enterprises. In Peru, in 1972, the Center for the Studies of People's Participation, uh, which was an initiative of the armed force, but it was a particularly um, government, it was a socialist uh, uh, government, and, and that uh, was founded by Brazilian anthropologist Darcy Ribeiro, along with Argentinian mathematician Oscar Barsavsky. And what they wanted was to, both of them actually work in Venezuela, interestingly enough, and, and Darcy Ribeiro and, and Barsavsky were very much influenced also by Manuel Sadowski. Um, and what they wanted to do in Peru was to create, uh, uh, well, a, a sort of think tank to create a comprehensive computational model of Peruvian reality of Peruvian society and economy. Um, once more, when we connect these with other endeavors, we have uh, 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 pioneering exhibitions like uh, the exhibition organized in 1969 by Jorge Glusberg, Art and Cybernetics at Bonino Gallery, which set up uh, uh, once more, um, he set up a, a, an interdisciplinary research group on arts and cybernetics, which brought together artists and designers together. Once more, also Manuel Sadowski was involved. He gave a lecture um, there. So once more, all these stories connect one with the other. And of course, I'm not going to uh, explain anything more than what, what we heard so vividly and thought-provoking by Ana Livia. But of course, Valdemar Cordero and, and his exhibition and Manifesto Artionica is also a, a, a prominent uh, highlight of the time. So I'm going to uh, uh, now talk a little bit about Francesco Mariotti and, and Teresa Burga. Francesco Mariotti is, is a Peruvian Swiss artist born in Switzerland, but raised in Peru, uh, internationally recognized as, pi as a pioneer in art and technology and participative, immersive and sensorial installations as well as an art, I will say, I will say he's an artist activist who critically assess cultural practice as, as a means of social engagement and articulation of current topics, discussions such as environmental and human rights, for example. Uh, he, he did, a, when he was a student, he was invited to Documenta along with his friend uh, Klaus Olmacher, uh, Documenta 4 in 1968. They did this immense ephemeral structure one of the things that is important from the work of Mariotti is that many of his work are ephemeral, but we have an archive, uh, which is based in the Museum of Art in Lima, 
which has all the documentation on, on, on his works. Um, and he did this amazing large cube shaped metallic structure with 9,000 light tubes, uh, a thousand fluorescent lamps, several loudspeakers, and it was a participative um, um, a structure. Um, but I, I would like to stress uh, uh, another work that, that he did uh, right after that uh, in 69, it was for the, he, he represented Switzerland in the 10th Sao Paulo Biennale. It was not an easy Biennale, it was a complex Biennale that year. Um, and he did this sort of Hindu temple, uh, he, which he called the circular movement of light. It consisted once more impressively of 240 triangular faces, four electronic systems that allowed continuous changes of light, color, smell, temperature, uh, and sound frequency. So the idea of this complex installation was to develop a, a collective synesthetic perception through the changes in, in this artificial environment. And the installation was prominently shown at the entrance of the of Art Basel in, uh, after, after Sao Paulo was in 69, it was shown in, 19, in 1970 at Art Basel. Uh, at the first art, uh, the inaugural Art Basel. Then in November 1971, it, it traveled to Lima, uh, to the International Pacific Fair. It was a most, possibly what the most popular attraction in Lima at that time. And once more, the idea um, of this work was that within one hour, one could experience a 24 hour cycle through continuous changes of light, color, sense, temperature, and, and sound. Um, he has been working in 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 techno sculpture or zoomorphic uh, technological sculptures like the ones he started to produce in the eighties, uh, which dwells with 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 um, with the idea of of um, artificial uh, creatures, but also inspired in nature. And uh, for that, he generated a software called Chuyachaki. Chuyachaki is a word in Quechua, which is, it defines a, a little. It's like a these are so, some sort of beings that. Are alive that are, are are part of the of the of the myths of the Amazon, um, and and these are sort of they are in between small demons, but also they seek to become your friends or become friends with human beings. So he developed this uh, software called the Chuyachaki Five along with Manolo Rodriguez, and uh, that software allowed uh, the generation of random uh, instances for any text, uh, in particularly pro poetry that was used in some of the installations like Rana. And there was a certain level of sophistication in, in, the, in relation to this randomness. Uh, for example, not only did it mean that the order changed, but also that the number of uh, instances in the poems uh, that were executed by the machine could be modified. So the results were very interesting on one hand because of this randomness that allowed the order of the poem to, to, to change, but also how there could become other meanings. And he invited different artists. He used also poems, historical poems, or he invited some artists that were working with, with poetry or with uh, interactive poetry at that time. So the idea of Mariotti was to transform this mystical and ecological spirit into somewhat a rhythmic computational model that allowed an understanding uh, or, and, and make us aware of the diversity uh, of the huge diversity in the planet, um, and and it's it's about a space that goes beyond. It's a little bit connected to 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 the to the uh, work we saw before. It's it's uh, uh, it's about a space that goes beyond the world, beyond the human what, what the human recognizes as uh, as 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 our own capacities, our own cognition and culture, but goes towards a larger ecosystem that inhabits the, the biosphere, plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, viruses, but also rivers, seas, winds, stones, trees, clouds that are part of, of actually many of the um, of, of, of these uh, elements are part of the uh, of the um, of the cosmovision of, 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 of the Andean and, and Amazonian communities still today they still prevail today. So this is precisely these are precisely aspects that challenge what is nowadays generally referred as artificial intelligence. Uh, machines because machines do not record a real world. They 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 do not recall real real world experiences. They record data. 
So in that in that sense, these are in some way works that make us reflect on on these contemporary topics. And then there is Teresa Burga. Uh, she passed away uh, recently. It was a multimedia artist whose conceptual works from the 60s and 70s uh, positioned her uh, as a pioneer in media art, but also in what uh, what we could call the information-based art. Um, and Burga dived into a vast array of possible combinations of information provided by disciplines that we, we will call today information theory, of course, cybernetics. Um, and that influenced um, her work, her interests, and, and developed many experiments that today could be around, could be called that are were around regulation, control, standardization, and, and profiling. Um, during her studies in the Art Institute of Chicago, she developed a series of conceptual artworks, some of which were only possible to be uh, built and executed in, the, in in recent retrospective of her works. She 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 she, she conceived them, but they were not uh, they were not built until recently. One of these is this work called "Work That Disappears When the Expectator Tries to Approach It." Uh, it's interesting that it's not just uh, the, the the explanation, but also the structure. We will talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But the 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 thing is that this uh, was a proposal for a for a light installation that uh, basically uh, it's an it's an interactive environment uh, of a, of a of an object that um, that scapes that is elusive as as uh, 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 and and this piece. Um, when we when we um, look at it, I mean, it's it's basically a piece uh, that it's set up in a large dark room with a grid-like arrangement of electric bulbs of different colors uh, at, at the rear wall, and this gradually turn off and uh, and on at random. So they form this vertical and and, and horizontal uh, rows on the panel. This is a participatory work which implies that the observer. Is always inclined to engage with it, uh, even it could be by curiosity, but also in 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 terms of a museum context, is is similar to the way in which um, uh, one examines a, a painting. And this this was an observation by, made by by Dr. Dorota Vichel, who she, who has also studied her work, the work of Teresa Burga quite well, well, along with Miguel Lopez, who are who is also a, a curator that has been researching on, on the work of Teresa Burga. Um, when she came back to Lima, interestingly enough, she didn't find a way in which people were interested in her structures. So she worked at the National Customs Administration in Peru, a government agency where she designed uh, structures in order to build information systems, to build software. So her, her, her interestingly enough, her work, um, both as an artist, as, an, as, as a civil servant, uh, were an early critique, uh, which today falls into the sphere of the massive use of information processing and analysis tools for personal data mining. Um, uh, a, a prominent work of hers is self-portrait, um, um, was an installation that was first presented in 1972 at the Ipna Gallery in Lima. And it was actually based on the close analysis of, uh, of Teresa Burga's own corporeal data through a series of diagrams and medical exam ex examinations performed uh, on one particular day on June 9, uh, 9, 1972. And this selection was divided in three sections, a face report, a blood report, and a heart report, aiming at narrowing down the different types of personal information into testable and depersonalized sources of data uh, through a, a scientific approach to herself. So. What happened here, here is that Burga uh, transforms this data into light and sound in some ways, into different uh, types of devices, also into uh, mind maps. So she reorganizes the information of her body. Um, uh, the work of Burga in that sense is, 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 is an evidence of how both conceptual um, uh, and systems art are inherently um, related to computer technology and shows her great capacity to organize information, to identify common elements and, and, and bring together um, uh, them as logical structures. So 
in concluding our exploration of, of both Mariotti and, 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 and Burga, we delve into artworks that not only embody the principles of participation, uh, of ephemerality, but are seminal in, in their foresight and engagement with critical issues that are highly relevant today. Challenges like artificial intelligence, human right advocacy, uh, the complexities of data regulation, uh, of data governance, the implications of control and standardization, as well as the uh, nonsense uh, debates surrounding personal data extraction and profiling. Thank you. Thank you, Jose Carlos. Thank you for your amazing presentation and for sharing your knowledge and thoughts and vision. And now, Rodrigo, is your moment. Okay, my moment to talk about um, art and technology in Argentina. Let me, uh, yeah, I have my presentation ready. And we're ready, okay. So, uh, let's see. Well, I am going to talk about the beginnings of electronic art in Argentina and uh, the relationship with happenings and mass media culture that was very important in Argentina of that time. So um, I'm going to read my presentation and it begins like this. Towards 1964, happenings were beginning to multiply in the Argentinian art scene promoted by the daring of some young artists attentive to the international art trends. In October of that year, a singular happening took place. The images show a truck that unfold mattresses, buckets of paints and chickens. Then the, inter the eruption of horses carrying cans of paints laid by a woman. Later, a rock band appears playing their music, but a young man begins to rub the members with ribbons until they are paralyzed. Finally, the place is filled with balloons and a couple of bodybuilders set out to make them explode in front of a serious audience dressed in a very formal way, completely bewildered. The promoter of all this is a 21-year-old woman. Her name is Marta Minujim. Here we see her enjoying the debacle that she has she just executed. She's behind one of the television cameras that has recorded the entire event and broadcast it in real time to the unnoticed viewers of a public program. Without knowing it, Minohin was performing one of the first happening broadcasted live on television in history. Like many pop artists, Marta Minujin was fascinated with the mass media. She disdained traditional artistic formats and believed that art should be a vital, immediate, and contemporary experience. That same year, 1964, she had won the prestigious prize of the Instituto Torcuato di Tela in Buenos Aires with an installation of multicolored mattresses that invited the public to relax and enjoy. Its title was Roll Up and Live. The following year, together with Ruben Santantonin, she designed a mega installation that invited the viewers to experience unusual and playful spaces. Its name, La Menesunda, a word that means something like confusion in Buenos Aires slang, warned about what could be found inside. A neon corridor, rooms without revolt rooms with revolving walls, a couple in bed, and a, an icy room you can only get out of it by guessing a number on a dial of a telephone. Near the entrance, there was a rare prayer device. Spectators were invited to climb a ladder to find three televisions, in one of which they could see their own image reproduced by a closed circuit TV. It was March 1965, and the Porta Pack weren't able yet. In fact, as far as we know, Nanju Paik received his in October of that year. But Minuhin, who had already had previous experience with television, 
managed to borrow a camera from a TV channel to carry out this experiment. Again, probably unknowingly, she was making one of the first closed secret TV artwork in history. The most curious thing about this is that she was not particularly interested in technology, or rather, she still didn't know. After her trip to New York that same year, and the knowledge of Martha, Marshall McLuhan's theories, everything was going to change. Starting in 1966, she immerses herself fully in technological research using all the means of communication at, at her disposal. In the realization of simultaneity and simultaneity, a happening that was to occur coincidentally in Buenos Aires, New York, and Berlin, in collaboration with Alan Capro and Volvo Stell, Minuhin creates a media environment with televisions, radios, films, slides, speakers, photographs, and telephones in order to highlight the transformations of, of the environment produced by the latest technologies. The project included the use of the early bird satellite in the interconnection of the three cities, but that did not happen. Would Marta Minujin have created the first artwork by satellite in history? The objective of Simultaneity in Simultaneity was to give back the event's participants their own images and sounds mediated in real time. But it was impossible with the means she had. That is why she decided to record that all the attendees in photographs, films, and sound recordings in one day and return all those records to them through televisions, speakers, radios, and slides in a second session, creating a kind of closed secret multimedia deferred in time. But there were still some technical problems. How to get participants to appear on television and radios? Minuhin had no better idea than to ask television channel, a television channel and two radio stations to broadcast the images and sounds to the air so that they would reach the participants of the event gathered at the Ditela Institute. But what have the viewers and listeners who unintentionally encountered these records on the air have understood? Would they think they were inside another happening? Finally, in 1967, in the framework of the Expo 67 in Montreal, Minuhin was able to carry out this project more adequately. But as expected, more media were incorporated in this new version. Here we have an image of Circuit Super Eterodyne, the work in question. The participants were, chose through, were chosen through a survey published in a local newspaper that interested parties had to fill out and send by mail. A computer chose the three groups of people by affinity. The three groups interacted with each other through different technologies that allowed them to observe, observe themselves and be observed. It was a very complex work with, which involved numerous levels of information and media with effective closed circuits, multiple interactions in real time, and the constant call to its protagonist to reflect on the experience they were living. Smarta Minuhin immersed herself more and more in technical complexities. A group of young artists in Buenos Aires medi meditated on the impact of this mass media on reality, the art circuit and aesthetics. Encouraged by, the re by these reflections, in July 1966, they published a manifesto with the title of An Art of the Mass Media, in which they expressed. In a mass civilization, the public is not in direct contact with cultural facts, but it is informed about them through the media. The mass audience does not see, for example, an exhibition, does not witness a happening or a football match, but watch its projection on a newscast. 
In any case, it is not interesting of consumers, it, but sorry, it is not in the interest of consumers of information, whether it is carried out or not. The only thing that matters is the image that the media builds on this artistic event. And they follow. We intend to build a work within those media. We intend to deliver to the press the written and photographic record of a happening that has not happened. This bogus report will include the names of the participants, an indication of where and when it was performed, and the description of the show that is feigned to have occurred with photos taken of the alleged participants in other circumstances. Thus, in the way of transmitting the information, in the way of realizing the not non-existent event, in the difference that arises between the various versions of the same event that each issuer makes, the meaning of the work will appear. A work that begins to exist at the same moment in which the conscience of the viewer constituted has already concluded. The work was finally performed in August 1965, 66, sorry. Various newspapers and magazines published the information of the false happening provided by the artists, and then they had to retract them as they learned of the deception. This work is known by the name of Happening for a Diseased Wild Boar. But the reflections of this group of, on art and the mass media did not end here. As a consequence of their actions, they wondered, could that piece carried out in the media be a happening? Also, it, also it was an ephemeral event and only persists in the memory of the public. Shouldn't a happening be participatory and spontaneous? Guided by these premises, they give shape to a kind of productions that they call anti-happenings, and that consisted of reenacting famous happenings based on their description of on the media. Among others, local versions of Meet Joy by Karol Schneemann and Auto Bodies by Kleist Oldenburg were performed from scripts and records, mostly textuals, obtained from different media. What is interesting here is what happens when these reproductions are in turn reproduced by the media as singular actions in the absence of the reference. Finally, another important moment this is another one from these anti-happenings. And finally, another important moment in the artistic research with the media was the work of the Frontera Group, a group that lasted a very short time, but long enough to participate in the information exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. The group was founded in 1969 with two visual artists, television worker, and an art critic specialized in semiotics. Its objective was to investigate the aesthetic possibilities of the mass media working with new technology of video. The same year, they made the installation Specta, for which they were invited to participate in the aforementioned exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. The work was composed of two, of two spaces and situations. First, a person entered a kind of mini television studio where he or she was asked questions and his or her answers were recorded in privacy. When the person left, he or she found a set of televisions in which he or she could see him or herself answering the questionnaire and also see the rest of the public present in that room reproduced on other monitors through closed circuit television. Here, the work with the mass media pursues a rather sociological and semiotic aim. The main points are the construction of messages, their private and public existence, the possible linguistic nature of art. All these episodes 
in the history of Argentinian art in the mid-60s revealed the extent to which the growing relationships between art and communication technologies were, were fertile fields of creation and intense arenas of debate in that time. Thank you. Thank you, Rodrigo, for your remarkable presentation. And now the last panelist from Mexico, Tania. Sorry. Hi, hi, Gaby. Hi, everybody. I will share my screen. So you're looking at my screen, right? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, many thanks, many, many thanks to you, Gabriela, for organizing this wonderful panel, but also this important exhibition. I believe this exhibition will mark a before and an after in these practices, especially because it is a very important uh, space and context and uh, platform for showing Latin American intersections between art, science, and, and technology to different audiences, practices that maybe uh, on to this uh, time has been, have been um, more local. And this is a very rich, this, this is what gives these practices its richness, but I think it's also very interesting and very important to project this work uh, into different uh, contexts and, and worlds. So I, I would like to, to start by, uh, yes, by talking about some of the intersections or some of the intensifications in knowledge and technology that are influencing uh, present practices as uh, we had in the 30s and 50s, um, intensifications in knowledge as in cybernetics, as uh, Jose Carlos Maria Tegui was, was talking, uh, cybernetics in a way was invented in Mexico because uh, Arturo Rosenbluth, Julian Bigelow, uh, and, um, uh, and uh, I, I, sorry, I forgot the name, the name of the mathematician. Oliver <laughs> Wiener. Norbert Wiener uh, wrote this, this wonderful impression and uh, paper on cybernetics, purpose, behavior, purpose on the and teleology. And it was like the starting point of, of cybernetics. But also uh, there is different uh, ways of, of intensifications of knowledge as uh, we are going to talk later about plasmogenia, the science that a uh, Mexican biology invented to ask questions about the living um, and who was uh, taken for pseudoscientists and how these kind of intensifications in knowledge uh, affect what is happening in, in artistic practices. Uh, I will start by, um, yes, what, what happens in the, happened in the 60s and 70s that were, um, a, and an intersection between uh, conceptual practices, experimental practices, feminisms, and what is happening with, with sound art. And then I will go to, uh, by the end of the presentation, uh, talk about um, biomediality, how these uh, different knowledges that, that we are seeing coming from the the beginning of the of the 19th, 20th century, how they are reflecting in what, what is happening now and biomediality, uh, the rewritings of the future and projects of uh, research and creation. So I will start by Paula Weiss. I would say that it's very important that Paula Weiss will be, will be in the show that uh, her work was unknown. She was also a pioneer in, in uh, in the interaction between the body and the camera. And happily, her work has been already um, collected by MUAC, by the Museum of Contemporary Art of the University. Uh, her video work is 
been preserved in uh, Tebunam, and he, all her documents are in Arteya, the documentation center of Muac. Uh, so now it's time to do research on what Paula was uh, researching, what she was asking in her time. And when I delve into, into her archive, it was amazing to see that the word that is uh, that it's repeated uh, insistently is perception. And so I owe uh, a research and a deeper diving in, in that archive, looking for the relationships between uh, Paula Weiss work and uh, present somatic practices that are being really intense in Mexico right now. Uh, and of course, the influence uh, that, uh, because uh, Paula Weiss, the, the exhibition was called La TV TV. Her interest was on television. So that is why I am showing this second uh, slide here with the piece by Polvo de Gallina Negra, uh, a collective, the first feminist collective in, in Mexico, uh, integrated by Maris Bustamante and Monica uh, Mayer, who did this intervention in open television. And they they put a, a yeah, pregnant belly to one of the most important, con uh, not conductors, uh, TV shows from, from the moment. And this is Jimena Cuevas. She did also an intervention in, in open TV in uh, 2001. So yes, I, I wanted to group this these three pieces and and say uh, about and, and talk about the the interest in the television as a as a machine of power and a, and a, and, a, and the political um, possibilities of inter intervening television live television open television. Um, Stridentismo, stridentism uh, in the beginning of the 20th century was also a practice uh, that is influencing what is happening today because uh, the intersections between art, science and technology in Mexico are uh, completely permeated by text and textuality and the question about um, extended Textualities, and here we have uh, two books by uh, uh, Quintanilla, who was a poet, and the one in the right was uh, what is uh, the poem that is uh, uh, considered like the first radio uh, poem because it was not referring to radio, but it was, as one critic said, a radiogenic poem. No, the the radio was integrated in the sound and in the concept of the the poem. Um, this is uh, La Formula Secreta the, uh, by Ruben Gámez, the first experimental film in Mexico. Also, it's uh, little known, uh, and, it, and in it, it also marks something very important because the, um, the text of the film is by Juan Rulfo, one of the most important uh, writers in Mexico, but uh, also a, a writer whose work uh, as an experimental artist has not been recognized as such. Uh, Juan Rufo is considered a writer, but he's, um, we know his photograph, but not this, um, this aspect of, of his work. And uh, there are also critics that like to, to do a, mark a lineage between um, this uh, this piece and what happened after in experimental practice. As for example, Ulises Carrion, this piece is the death of the art dealer where uh, Ulises Carrion is his only video piece. He did mostly uh, writing, uh, experimental writing, conceptual writing and, and sound pieces. Also, his work is, uh, is very little known or was very little known uh, until some retrospective that, retrospectives that happened uh, some years ago. One of them in uh, in uh, Museo Reina Sofia in, in Madrid. 
Uh, but before that, he was well known for the sound art, something that in Mexico is also very important and and a and a, a practice that has also like it's uh it should be considered like close to art, science, and technology, but it has its own uh, spaces of recognition and and uh, it has its important place in Mexico. And this is La Máquina Estética by Manuel Felgueres from 1975. It is also considered like the first uh, algorithmic uh, composition piece, the first software art uh, produced in, in, in Mexico. And we can see the, uh, also, sorry, the, this is uh, Poema Colectivo Revolución. This was a collective that was uh, impulsed by Araceli Zúñiga, and Cesar Espinosa, they did this, they did this wonderful project that lasted for uh, around 30 years, um, which was um, a very interesting expanded writing and textuality, um, experimental writing uh, project. This was, uh, this poem was a male art uh, project that they received um, pieces from all around the world, 42 countries. And um, now that also their archive has been uh, preserved and uh, Luis Kamnitzer curated a wonderful show in, in New York with, with the pieces so, of Poema Colectivo Revolución. Um, this is uh, Veronica gerber Vicetti. I put her here because of the uh, strength that that is the present in, in sexuality in the in contemporary practices. I will go faster. And this is um Aparato Sifi, a piece of, uh, of uh, it is focused on uh, science fiction, um, but it also features a bot. So this is the research on different what what they call Proto cyber uh, fiction from science fiction, sorry, proto -cyber science fiction from Mexico, starting from the poem uh, Primero Sueño by Tor Juana Inés de la Cruz, which is a, a voyage um, traveling through the through the cosmos and uh, in dialogue with uh, with the uh, knowledge from from the 16th century, especially she was very fund to do the the work of uh, medieval so I am sorry um and then we are going to see uh practices that more we're coming more to the present this is this Atari noise by, by Arcangel Constantini uh, Atari Noise is a piece by the 90s. It was an intervention to Atari, to the video game Atari, um, and Unos Unos y Unos Ceros. This was the first net time piece uh, in Mexico. And this is Frequency Volumen by Rafael Lozano Gemer. I think this, this uh, exhibition that Priamo Lozada curated in Laboratorio de Alameda was uh, a moment when um, Mexican audiences really um, uh, meet Rafael Lozano Hemmer's work. And this is one of uh, of my favorite pieces by him because it was reflecting on the privatization of radio signals in Mexico in, in, that, in that time. And uh, finally, to come to the present and talk about biomediality, I, I want to talk a little bit about this uh, plasmogenia, which was a science, a science of the origin of life as this this book said by uh, Alfonso Luis Herrera, biologist who also was the 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 biologist that institutionalized uh, the um, the study of 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 the living in in Mexico. He started the the botanical garden, uh, and uh, and on the right we have uh, the book Protocells, which is like the textbook for protocells for the the. Um, uh, molecular biology. And if you open this book in the first uh, page, 
they acknowledged the work of Alon Alfonso Luis Herrera, which, by the way, was considered pseudoscientific and uh, had a lot of problems in Mexico, but uh, because of uh, doing research on these, on on these, uh, or or doing research and also experiments on trying to find like the origin, the origin of life. Uh, this is uh, interspecific Codex Virtualis, a piece, uh, uh, Codex Virtualis, so, sorry, inter interspecific is, is uh, collected from Mexico um, and they do research. And what is very interesting of their practice is that they also always connecting uh, knowledge with, uh, with uh, sharing the knowledge in workshops and uh, and, uh, and different uh, formats and scenarios. Um, Codex Virtualis, sorry for the miswriting, it's Codex, not Fidex, um, is a hybridization of, uh, on the one hand, uh, fantastical um, creatures, as creatures coming from the, the Codex Serafinianum, which is a fictional codex, or different uh, fictional sources, let's say, and on the other hand, um, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. So what they are uh, speculating on, uh, they are as, uh, working also with extremo files, extremo, uh, these kind of creatures that can live outside uh, in space and that, that can survive uh, different situations outside outside um, the atmosphere. So this is a speculative project that I think is very linked to what we saw before with um, Alfonso Luis Herrera, even though the, this, the, the work of, of Alfonso Luis Herrera is not, uh, not known, uh, really well known in, in Mexico. This is Gilberto Esparza, Coralistis, uh, a project where he's working uh, with trying to recuperate the arrecifes de coral in, um, in the coast of, of Mexico, building these uh, artificial uh, coral uh, coming from, uh, the, um, constructed with uh, ceramics and with the process of electrolysis, uh, it, uh, it activates the, the natural process of filling uh, the the gaps and um bridging again organic matter and this is autophotosynthetica a, a piece that was um or a project that that was reflecting on the sewage and uh, debris from the from the city and taking uh, energy from the from the debris of the city and and the, in the center, the, there is this community of organisms, living organisms, that are uh, getting the the or doing their energy for doing the photosynthesis from the energy of the of the the water, the polluted waters. This is plantas nomadas, also a piece that was uh, focused on recuperating the the. Contaminated, contaminated water of a, of a river using the contamination to feed the plants and, and do the, uh, its process of energetic interaction. And this is a senia, um, a machine of uh, organic impression printing uh, by Electrobiota, a collective uh, by, uh, integrated by Gabriela Munguia and uh, Lupe Chavez, the piece is from uh, 20, 2016. Um, and this is a printer, um, a very slow printer that, that prints uh, with, uh, with organic matter. And um, you can see the, the grass on the, on the right side um, from, the, from the prints, the, the seeds that were put there with the, with the machine. This is, um, by the Colectivo um, Arte Más Ciencia, Art Plus Science. Um, 
there this is a collective very active and in, in mexico and the university and uh, especially uh, their leader maria antonia gonzalez valerio who is uh, a theorist and a philosopher and and curator living and, and working in in mexico and she's very um a very interesting author also um before this uh, this book she um she published encuentros de animales meetings uh meeting of animals meetings of animals uh reflecting on, on animality and i want to finish with uh with two pieces one is Tinamecuta. Uh, this is uh, by marcela armas um and uh, it's a project, a, a large project. Uh, in the left side, we see Marcela doing a ritual with a maracame, who is um, a, a participant of the Witsarika, sorry, Witsarika culture. Um, Marcela did this uh, beautiful instrument, air instrument, and uh, she worked with a pierrotita, um, a stone from the Huitzaglica culture that they um, lent the, the stone to her. And in this uh, intervention, in this performance with, uh, with the maracame, they, they built um, a device where both Marcela and the maracame put their hand and this Stone Pierrotita has a quality that whenever a abrupt change happens, the stone changes its orientation towards the magnetic field of the earth. So um, the the behavior of the of the of the stone were, was um, recorded or was altered by this um, joining of hands and hearts between Marcela and the Maracame. And finally, this is a, a piece by Tania Candiani. She did this piece uh, um, during the project La Gravedad de los Asuntos. Um, she did this um, prototype of uh, one of the first um, flying machines, the, the machine, the Pesnier. Um, Yes, and, and, and I didn't talk about um, astronomy, but astronomy is also a very important knowledge in in Mexico that has influenced uh, and had a, a very interesting um, conversation along with, with artists also. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tanya. I want to appreciate. Thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. I, I want to let everyone know we have come to the end of our hour and a half, which is a shame because this has just been extraordinary. And, and I do, I know Gabriela uh, is with me in saying we are really excited to continue this conversation, this very rich conversation. There are so many ideas to talk about. Uh, leading up into the exhibition in September 2024, we will have a number of Zoom uh, projects with the artists that are going to be part of Arteanica. Uh, our first uh, next episode being on December 13th. So we do invite you to join that. I want to say thank you again to Ana Livia Cordero, Dr. Jose uh, Carlos Maratigue, Rodrigo Alonso and Tania Aedo, and of course, our chief curator, Gabriel Ortiaga. Um, this has just been amazing. Um, our audience has put some fantastic comments in the chat too, so I'll leave that open for a few minutes for everyone to take a look at. Um, thank you to our audience for being here. Uh, I, I'm excited for this, Gabriela. I can't wait. Uh, we'll see you all next time. Thank you.